since the day one of the first edition. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Societe Generale uh, IT department uh, support us uh, since last year. Uh, so we are uh, uh, really happy to have them on board. And uh, if you uh, want to share uh, cyber security with, uh, with our SOC and CERT member, uh, there's a lot of good resources uh, inside the, uh, the, this team. So uh, let's go to Twitter to, to exchange with them. Uh, we are very proud this year to, um, uh, to uh, uh, welcome uh, ANSI for the first year. Uh, ANSI is a French government uh, of uh, defensive security agency. Uh, and uh, we are very proud to have uh, them also on board. And last not but, but not the least, uh, Silver Sponsor, Synactive, since uh, last year, this uh, red teaming, pen testing, and uh, auditing company uh, support us. Uh, thanks for that. Um, we also uh, received support in a different way. Uh, we have used um, this year and uh, since last year, uh, Pretix. Pretix is a, a free software and a, a software solution. Uh, to manage uh, event, it is a full feature uh, uh, management solution. If you have, uh, if you run a, a festival, if you run a, a conference, uh, let's give a look. Uh, uh, they are, they have and um, implement a lot of uh, useful uh, feature to run uh, that kind of event. We have used it uh, on a SaaS model, but you can run it on uh, on premise. So um, yes, uh, we really want to uh, uh, to, uh, to have a look on it. And last, uh, Lille University uh, give us uh, give us access to the Zoom plan. So thanks for that. Um, we want to share also one point uh, because uh, um, virtual edition and physical uh, edition of an event is quite different and have. Um, uh, and has a, a, lot, a lot of impact on expense. And uh, in our case, it is a big drop in our def uh, in a, of our expense. No more travel reimbursement for speakers, no more on-site communication, no more catering, no more shamanics. It is a private joke for last year uh, attendees and so on. Uh, so it, is, um, it has an impact. So we have decided uh, to invite our um, uh, this year sponsor to stay sponsors for uh, for next year uh, at no cost. It was uh, a decision quite easy to uh, to do, in fact, and uh, we want to be uh, transparent with uh, our sponsor, and uh, we have uh, take this decision. One question uh, we have to talk about: uh, Do you think Zoom is a free software? Right. Not sure, not sure at all. Uh, it is a till the air answer, but we want to share more, a little more, uh, and share why we have decided to go to Zoom uh, instead of, uh, for example, GTC or Big Blue Button. Or, uh, it is our argument. We you can uh, we can have a longer discussion on, on free node if you want. Uh, our argument is ah. Oh, a small team. We are a small team, uh, four part-time people to run uh, the event. Uh, so uh, we are not video expert, um, and we decided to um, to emphasize uh, the the quality of uh, rendering for uh, our speaker works, uh, and uh, we really uh, we really want to expose them uh, in the most uh, valuable um, way. So uh, we have taken a least risk approach and uh, have decided to use, you, to use Zoom. We also received the support from Lille University, as uh, previously said, uh, with our Zoom plan. So we have shared. Uh, you just have to make your own idea about it. Um, a new thing, we are going to have a concert online. Uh, yes, uh, we are maybe the only guys uh, that decided to set up a concert the first time when they switched to virtual uh, quite 
not obvious decision, but uh, it is our. So um, uh, let's talk about uh, the artist, uh, Clément Odo, which is a, a free software developer and the lead developer of the web SSO product, uh, Lemon LDAP NG, uh, is also an artist, uh, is a songwriter and a singer. He, uh, he writes French songs. Uh, he distributes them under a CC uh, C license, and uh, is going to um, uh, to propose us a live concert tomorrow evening at uh, um, uh, five uh, five fifteen. And uh, you've got the the, the URL of the concert there, but you uh, you don't rush uh, to, to note it. It is on the schedule. Everything, the bio, the SoundCloud uh, uh, account of Clément and uh, the URL of the live concert. So it is, uh, it will be so uh, tomorrow uh, evening. Uh, let's talk about just a moment about uh, the conference. You are going to be able to uh, to ask questions through the chat, or um, we preferred a few uh, through the Q &A, um, button on Zoom. Speaker speakers will answer to them at the end of the talk uh, if it if it is uh, remains. Uh, uh, time at the end. Uh, discussion, it, uh, I've got an error. It is PTS uh, 2020 on Freenode and not uh, PTS 20. Uh, if you want to have a longer discussion, PTS, uh, yes, PTS uh, 2020 on Freenode. And on Twitter, uh, you, uh, you can follow PazoSaltCon, Twitter handle. And uh, if you want to, um, uh, to use a hashtag, it is PTS 20. So uh, we are going to have uh, the keynote in uh, the next four minutes. Uh, so we are going to have uh, a short pause between the, the stage uh, will be take, uh, taken by uh, Pauline and, um, and Alexandre.
So we are kicking off uh, le, our event with Pauline and uh, Alexandre for a keynote, a 20 minute keynote. Please welcome us. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon and good morning for some and good evening. Um, everyone can see my screen? Is it okay? Okay, great. Because I'm not sure that the full screen is working there. Okay. Okay, so doing a keynote for security is a bit unusual, but uh, in this day, I think uh, Pauline and I, and I, we decided to do a keynote, not really on about security, but on how to build a um, better open source project. So how everything started. Um, it's basically due to the lockdown and the uh, pandemic uh, part. So we had this uh, discussion. So we, we both work on this project and various projects. And um, initially, we we're like, OK, so we should do some work on open source project and we have this kind of obscure open source natural language processing project um, should we work on it and so on but we were facing a kind of dilemma and because we were like it's a pandemic we need to do something about it and we need to even uh, work for us and so on and we say okay maybe we should just should do just you know close uh, face mask and that's basically where everything started we started to do face mask and there is something interesting too. Um, so what we have seen when doing that, uh, we see a lot of similarities with open source projects, especially rules, practices, and so on. And we did learn a lot, learn a lot, a lot of things. Even if we are strongly engaged in open source development and so on, we basically discover a lot of things uh, due to the fact of, of a, lot, a lot of people doing uh, face masks. So we started a project called uh, Myanmar Project, um, it's a funny name, so I think this name came like very late in the evening. Um, I don't remember <laughs> the time, but I think Pauline remembers the times exactly. But um, it was like, Around, um... yeah, something like that, yeah. Uh, and we we basically had this this idea of contracting a Chinese word for Mian Mo, which was like a face mask and this kind of IKEA uh, style. Uh, things and we have this Mayan Mu project. Um, so you can go to the website, you can go to the GitHub uh, project and have a look at it. So we basically started that project and we discovered by doing so that a lot of, of, of new things popping up like um, rules, things about open source projects that we, we knew about and, and stuff that were new and so on. And we wanted to share with you today all discoveries, uh, maybe at the end when you build a new open source project in the security field. Uh, to basically follow those rules. And, and we failed too. So uh, we won't keep with, and we will not give you golden rules, but we, we found some interesting uh, aspect there. So I think one of the most important thing, and then this one was like, I think for us a, a bit of a challenge, but we discovered that one. So your project has to resonate and, and, and be human. Um, so it sounds like a bit like, you know, philosophical and so on, but it's really simple. Um, and simple fact, I mean, Pauline has a very small nose and I have a big nose. So it's simple fact. Um, if you design face mask, people with big nose might have problem with uh, mask design for people with small nose. Makes sense. So, and that's the thing is, and it's valid, valid for open source project too, you need users. If you don't have users, you cannot design your software, you cannot design your face mask, you are under into problems. So, and Going back to the roots of open source project, if you remember Eric Raymond for maybe the old guys like Christophe and so on, that was very old guys. Uh, remember all those um, documents and reports where he has this famous document called the Cathedral and the Bazaar, where he explained that you basically have users, you need users. If you don't have users, basically you are not doing something right. And that's exactly the same with face mask. Uh, and what we decided to do is to be our first users, uh, put in, required some masks for uh, going to the shop. I required some masks for going outside too. So we designed our own mask. And we were our first user. So this mantra is super important. Uh, eating your own dog food is super important. And we have seen that with other projects. I mean, we had some success in some open source projects like Miss Project and so on, because we were using the software and developing the software at the same time. 
But if you basically design without thinking about the users, uh, I think you are prone to fail. And that's really one of the things. And we have seen that with the, uh, um, the face mask project. Second thing that we have seen is uh, don't be afraid to try new things and learn from scratch. Uh, for example, um, if you look at open source projects, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I don't want to contribute to open source project. I don't know how to code and so on. Same with face mask. For us, we had no fucking clue about sewing. Uh, we had no fucking clue about filter of textile and fabrics. Um, if I remember, I was like digging into documents about like what is the best textile. I discovered about jersey, cotton, polycotton, and so on that didn't know about it. So for me, it was like digging into it and starting to reach it. And that's, that's quite, it was quite interesting. Um, and the thing that we, we did from the early beginning is like keeping a trace of everything we, uh, we did. Uh, you saw the picture there. It's basically uh, the folder of Pauline with all the experiments she did uh, for all the different face masks um, and the different uh, fabrics and so on. So it was like kind of, of git logs of everything that has been done. And it was like a very important thing. And, and the thing that is interesting is how we started to design face mask. It was like, okay, we go on the internet and we go on Google, search for face mask design. And the first thing that you'll see, it's YouTube. YouTube, you have tons of face mask design things. It's very interesting and so on, but which one to start with? Which one to pick? It's super tough. Um, if I remember correctly, we have seen like thousands and thousands of videos from, from Asia, from, from Thailand, from South Africa, uh, North America, Brazil, and so on. All different videos, different language, uh, with something funky cultural, uh, background and so on but at the end you have to pick a, a video and try and that's that we did we basically pick a video and make a test and you see all those experiments are basically all those different models um, and that's quite interesting because when you pick a video on youtube you don't need to pick it by basically like selecting all those four or thousand or five thousand videos you basically pick the one that google choose for you so you basically have a bias it's coming from the youtube recommendation algorithm that you get this data from them and you don't know why you propose that one, but that's maybe a completely biased one, but that's, you know, you have to deal with that. So and that's something that we have seen is video is nice to replay and basically have a basic training for makers, but there's documentation missing. And that's where we were trying to fill the gap. It's like from the video itself, we try out, document the failures, the success and publish it. And that was the main project is really that is like, publishing what we uh, basically did, where we failed. And you see that we have a lot of iterations and that's the interesting part. And I think for open source project is exactly the same. Um, but again, if you uh, do open source project, don't hesitate to publish about your failures. I know a lot of people want to have a clean GitHub repository uh, with all the things that are perfect and so on. It's like for academia, it's always better if you are publishing your failures. So that's Try and don't be afraid to show off things that failed and so on. Another thing is tooling. Um, uh, what you can see on the slide, we are using uh, BBB for the, the, the chat. So Pauline and I were using it on a, on a daily basis for discussing the project and so on. We were sharing screen. Um, so we had all those issues with like uh, no uh, sound not basically synchronized. Uh, okay, we were not using Zoom. So I mean, maybe why, but um, we were sharing screen using, for example, in this case, Inkscape uh, for uh, designing the logo, the tutorials, and so on. Uh, it, it was really a thing. So the tooling aspect is super important. It's really, uh, you basically take back the control of things that you are producing, and you become really producer of the things. Um, just to go back to some theory, uh, if you have time and you want to dig into that, uh, there's a very interesting aspect, which is really the background of open source project and, and, and free software. It's the book from Ivan Illich, uh, Tools for Conviviality. It was published in the 73, so I know, was not even born at that time. Maybe Christophe was, I think. Um, but that's something that is, is quite important there. It's really the background of, of why people have to have the uh, tools that are accessible for them. They can control the tools themselves and they can uh, basically have an equal access to it. And the thing, for example, with sewing machine and so on is really that um, if you can dismantle them, uh, basically get one, understand how it works and so on, is really this kind of process. And you see that you become part of the actions and you 
become part of the action of creating your own tools. And that's really uh, interesting. A small pity that we have seen during all those discussions about face mask design is a lot of things that were shared were shared on platforms that were super accessible, but not always open source. For example, we have seen a lot of people using Google Docs. Super easy. They drop the uh, pictures, the uh, um, uh, step-by-step guides of how to do the mask and so on. But it's, it's easy, it's simple for them. So it's, I think, something to keep in mind well, for the open source project that you are working on. Make it as easy as possible because you may get more users. Another thing that we have seen that's quite funky too, um, and, and I think it's, it's linked to different things. Yes, um, and I think we had this discussion with Paul in a, a lot regarding what is really the trigger of, of, of people basically sharing and so on, and, and what are the things that are helping them for sharing. Obviously, time, time constraint. Um, so we had this discussion about what is time, it's really a, uh, urgent, we need to, to have those masks. Uh, so we don't really care about intellectual property rights. And you see that those rights usually add viscosity, add complexity and so on. In this case, we had a lot of flexibility of creative exchange and so on, just by the fact of, of timing constraint. Another thing is, was like the social pressures. I mean, everyone wants to, to go in the same directions, protecting people and so on, and that's really helping. Another thing that we have seen is every work we did for the past 25 years on licensing and so on, and maybe some people have in, in the audience know about that, but there's a lot of existing uh, framework for licensing. The Free Software Foundation did some, the Open Source Software Initiative did some, and the Creative Commons Initiative. There are some others, but those ones are really uh, helping everyone. So a lot of people were just like GitHub selecting a license, and that's it. They didn't even care about the license they were choosing and so on. But the most funny part is a lot of, of people that were designing closed face mask designers didn't even know they were doing open source. They were doing open source without knowing it. And that's another thing that is quite interesting too, is there's a huge amount of people that could collaborate to your open source project. Uh, they just need to be informed about what is open source and what is the community behind, what is the goal of it. Another thing that is really important is, is if you build a project, you need to uh, reinforce the social relationship. During, obviously, lockdown, it was a bit harsh and difficult for a lot of people, so I think fun and funny project is important. Uh, so on the left side, you can see some, some, some screenshot. Uh, those ones are the, the less sensitive one. Uh, we see, for example, pa Pauline having a huge bowl of uh, miso soup. Um, she's converting sometimes uh, a close mass into bra, so, but that's personal matter, so everything is fine. Um, so it's really important. It's, it's sharing and, and giving back to the community and keeping it fun. Uh, something I discovered personally that's quite kind of interesting too, a lot of open source people were like part-time open source contributors. They were working at uh, the office, come back at home, doing some contribution. But now we were all in the same boat, all having to contribute 100% into open source projects. And that was quite interesting because we were all facing the same problem that some contributors that I knew about were like, oh, you know, remote working is painful, you know? You know, and we're like, oh, 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 yes, it's not painful. But at the end, we discovered it was like painful and difficult. So it's really important that we really rely on, on, on those capabilities and people that are already know about 100% remote um, to manage those communities. And I really advise, and it's not because the guy is Belgian, but I really advise to read a book from Peter Inchians called Social Architecture Building Online Communities. He explained from the zero MQ communities how to deal with the open source uh, communities is super important. So if you start an open source project in security, read that book. It's really cool. It's explaining to you how to deal with contributors, even difficult contributors and so on. And that's really, really interesting. Again, fun is super important. You see that uh, you can jump into a box when you are uh, remotely. No one has been hurt. No cats has been involved here, but you see it can be fun. Um, Another thing that you, you, it's very important is to cultivate your of, uh, open source project. And the only way to do that is uh, some people will say the gift community, some people they call it reciprocity or economy, but re reciprocity is very important. If you start to have people creating issues, pull requests and so on, if you reply back to them, it will dynamize and cultivate your first projects. It's super important. And at the end, uh, when you share the same tools, and you see I'm going back to the tools, tools are super important. Uh, you don't exactly know that, but sometimes you are, when you, for example, do gardening, you do 
art and so on, you really rely on your tools. And that's the same for free software. Um, if you share tooling for supporting your tools and so on, it's, it's really helping the community and it's creating values for everyone. Uh, obviously, when, when you start to create an open source project, you create knowledge. Uh, for example, Philip, that is part of uh, uh, the past social team, has a super wiki. Every time you search something for RFID, boom, you end up on his wiki. Because he is basically putting his knowledge into a wiki, he's documenting it, and he's indexed by Google. And that's really important. Um, and that, for example, if you find a bug fixes on an open source project that the guy doesn't want to fix, he will add it a, a patch on his wiki. That's cool. So that's every contributor should do. And that's another thing that is quite important too for face mask. For example, we, we have seen that diversity is important because people have different faces. They, uh, they have different requirements. I mean, someone working full time in a shop has different requirements as someone just traveling by the subway to go somewhere and just having a face mask for 30 minutes. So that's things that if you have more people, more users and more contributors, you can basically uh, cultivate your, your project on the long term. That's quite important. During the project, we were uh, using a lot of open source projects, but I just want to list some of them that we were using. Um, and uh, this one is my, I would say, frustration and complaint about a, a French agency. I use Python quite a lot, especially for extracting a large table of filtering tests. So the organization was sharing a PDF, and this PDF was generated from Excel. So I asked them to share the Excel and say, we are not allowed to share the Excel. So you end up by using Python to extract that. Was useful, but at the end, you see, sometimes you have to find a way to, to extract that. Um, a lot of things that were interesting too is Science Hub, which is not per se an open source project, but it's basically a, a door to paywall and basically it's breaking paywalls was uh, for us very important because we were able to access academic papers doing tests and filtering on textile fabrics, which is a very important matter when you build masks, which textile to use, which one is basically more filtering, which one are filtering viruses, or one bacteria and so on. Another thing that we want to thank everyone too is basically the people that did face masks um, during those days. Uh, because they were part of the community without even knowing it. And that's quite important too. Sometimes when you do open source software, you don't know that in advance. So what we can, we can say after those months of, 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 of project, we say that we succeed in some way. Uh, I mean, open source and maker communities resonated much more than, than usual. Um, during the crisis, a lot of initiatives started, uh, supporting hospitals, local communities, people, and so on, even your neighborhoods and so on. So it was really like quite successful. We have seen that a lot of open source thing that has been done in the past was useful. The licensing aspect and so on, all those hardware licensing and so on make, make a lot of sense. All people doing 3D printing, licensing and so on make a lot of sense. We have seen a lot of people using Git for supporting their coordination effort and for content publishing. Uh, it's, you, we see that more and more. So that's where we succeed. But we fail too. Um, Still, some open source tools are super complex to use. I mean, people uploading video on YouTube is, is an example. I mean, for them, it's super easy. They upload a video and that's it. But we have no, for example, good open source tools for editing, commenting videos and to mix match those two, video and content. Because this, sometimes when you, you want to, for example, make a, a mask and you look at a video, you want to pause it and to really understand, okay, what the people behind it is, just, for example, is this um, uh, return part? Is it the mask in, in up front? Uh, where do you want to use it? And, so, and sometimes you have to stop and, so, and there's no explanation. And then you have to go back to the video to see the previous one. Did he swap the mask after one and so on? So we really need some, some, some stuff in that area. Another thing that we, and I think uh, Ange Albertini will be very happy with that. He, he did a talk some, some, uh, some years ago, I don't know if it was two years ago at, at KLU about the fact of we are really bad at archiving what we produce. And I think he was right. And we are still very bad. If you look on, you look on GitHub right now, all the face mask design, 3D printing and so on, for, it's, you have hundreds of them. Some have no readme, no text, no explanations, just a drop of, of files. They have no labels, no classification and so on. So there's a lot of work as, as a kind of librarians for open source where we have to index, evaluate, for example, evaluating all the face mask design, which one is good, which one is bad, which one is more for European faces, one for the Asian faces, and so on. So in coordinating all of those. And, and when doing the project, we fail literally on something very important. Uh, 
I think all in the software community and open source community know about this mantra, release early, release often. I was like knowing about it and I super failed about it. Why? Because the thing is mask, we were needing them at really very fast way. And we were like, like polishing the website and so on and saying, okay, two weeks or three weeks is fine. No, we should have released it as first day. Even it was like draft super early, we should have done that. And I think, again, we failed on that one, even if you knew it for years, I think in, for my side, I know it for more than 20 years, <laughs> but I failed. So that's, that's the thing. Uh, another thing is, is, is there, we have plenty of opportunity for new, uh, new open source project. Um, one, and you have seen that during the, in the presentation and the slide that I have here, I have a lot of screenshot of BBB. Um, that's great, but the thing is, I want to, to stop my markdown at the same time I'm doing the context with the video and so on. So there are plenty of opportunities for a new open source project. And I would dream to have an open source project where you can do not taking markdown, stop screenshot what you have seen on a, a video chat and so on. And you can see directly what um, um, has been done there. So that's it for the, the keynote. So you see that this project, which was like nothing to do uh, with the directly open source, for us was like a kind of trigger, say, okay, we are still badly documenting how we do open source project. And that's where we want to go there. Um, Pauline is working on a document that uh, we will publish after on, afterwards, uh, describing what we discover, at least from, from our side. Um, we, we have some bibliography, and I think if you have time to read those, uh, have a look at those one, and I would really advise you to read the fourth one uh, about social architecture, especially if you have an open source repository and you maintain and deal with contributors, it's really insightful. Um, so now if you have any questions, uh, either Pauline or myself can answer uh, those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, effectively, we have got uh, some Q&A uh, possible. So if you have got, uh, we have got uh, three minutes to, to ask questions uh, more directly to uh, Alexandre and Pauline. And uh, after, uh, if you remind them, uh, you can uh, ask some, um, some question on, uh, on Freenode. Uh, maybe uh, have you got uh, a first question, uh, Philippe? Yeah, I can start as there is nothing in the pipeline. Um, you mentioned <laughs> quickly my wiki, thank you. But uh, actually, uh, I was facing a more security issue with that some years ago. It was very easy to make uh, open platforms open for addition to everybody mm -hmm. and uh, get uh, everyone collaborating online. But today, I take my wiki as an example, it's just impossible to even leave registration on without a massive capture. So how today can you make such open platforms very easy and open for contribution and avoid these <clears throat> bots? What did you want to answer or should I? <laughs> I think so it's something we discussed before that uh, there are huge needs for uh, platforms that can manage at time that we need to be efficient in collaboration and also we need to stay uh, to have good rule of privacy and to protect our data. And it can be more sensitive if you go on different projects. Uh, um, I, I have no answer yet. Uh, I don't know for Alex, if you got any ideas of things that have been done previously. Yeah, the thing is, it's a kind of a pity, but what I will say might, might uh, I think, uh, rise some hand there. But um, for what I've seen is, some that are successful, like Wiki, like that, uh, have this kind of notification against Google. So instead of using a CAPTCHA, they use centralized single sign-on, again, existing like GitHub services and so on. So the only one, for example, I'm thinking of HackMD and some others like that, you register with your GitHub account and you basically just start mm. to contribute and so on. So that's one way of, of avoiding like spamming and so on, because those accounts are registered and known. Uh, but I don't favor it for a matter of privacy and so on, because you basically get the tracking services from your providers and so on. So uh, I think Philip has a very interesting point. Uh, but to be honest, I still don't know exactly how to solve it. Um, but that's maybe an interesting project to, uh, to ease self-registrations and contributions without having spammer or at least less spammer. Uh, 
I think Wikipedia is facing the same kind of problems uh, too, um, and some others. Uh, but that's, in, in my experience on that, I, I don't see a direct like functionality or idea that could solve this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, it seems no no more question in uh, in the pli pipeline Q and A. So um, thank you very much for this keynote, uh, Pauline and uh, uh, and Alexandre. And now okay, we are you. going uh, we are going to start our first um, first session dedicated to a more security identity. We are going to start with uh, Neil Samiet from Kudelski Security, speaking about FID2. Welcome, uh, Niels, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. I believe uh, you need to stop sharing for me to be able to share. Yeah, it is done. Thank you. Um, All right. Can you see my slides? It's OK. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, today I will be talking about replacing passwords with FIDO2. My name is Niels and I'm on the research team at Kudelski Security. I don't need to tell you that uh, passwords are a problem. Uh, many big players in the industry and probably anyone uh, that's ever used a password knows um, there are many problems with those. So is there a way we can actually do better? Um, enters FIDO2, a new specification that was developed by the FIDO Alliance. And it is actually the combination of two specifications. The first being web authentication or web auth n. And the second is the client to authenticator protocol or CTAP. And the combination of these two specifications um, aim to address uh, multiple use cases in uh, authentication or login. The first one is uh, one that completely gets rid of passwords. So it's a passwordless uh, authentication. You can also do what they call multi-factor authentication. Uh, that means passwords, passwordless plus another factor such as a pin or a, a fingerprint or uh, your face, let's say um, a biometric. And finally, uh, the, the last use case is uh, you can also do the regular uh, username and password login plus an additional uh, second factor um, such as uh, let's say a security key that you possess. Um, previously, that was done with the U2F, uh, Universal Second Factor Standard, and in FIDO2, that was renamed to CTAP1, and it's completely backwards compatible um, uh, with the old standard. So in FIDO2, you have three main actors. Uh, the first one is the client, that's the device that you use. Um, it has a web browser that can be uh, your laptop or your smartphone. The second is what they call the relying party or the RP. And that is the server that wants to authenticate you. And finally, there is a device that the client uses that's called the authenticator. And that's what the client uses to prove who they are. So there's two specifications, but what are their purpose? So the first one, uh, WebAuthN, is actually made for web browsers. So it's a JavaScript API. But the client to authenticator protocol is a way for clients to communicate with authenticator devices. 
um, that's basically a way to have a standard for communicating with those devices. And when the client communicates with an authenticator, it will send messages that are encoded in a format called CBOR. And one difference here is that the CTAP protocol is actually not just for web browsers. So it also works um, with desktop and let's say command line apps, uh, unlike WebAuthn. We mentioned authenticators. Um, there's actually two different types of authenticators. The first one is platform authenticators. So that means the authenticator is permanently attached to the client device. So it cannot be removed. Um, for example, your smartphone or your laptop is the authenticator itself. The second type of authenticator is a roaming authenticator. And that one is not permanently attached. So that means you can plug it into multiple devices. Um, for example, either using USB or NFC or also Bluetooth, uh, but that's less common for those authenticators. There are many different vendors of such authenticators. Uh, if you are into open source, there is one which is called a solo key and the firmware is open source. And there is also something worth mentioning, the OpenSK or Open Security Project, that is a Rust implementation of a FIDO2 uh, authenticator. If you want to get one of those rom uh, roaming authenticators, they are pretty cheap and uh, you can get one for roughly 20 US dollars. Here you have a few examples of those authenticators. Um, and you can notice that the two on the bottom right are actually platform authenticators. All right, so how does it work actually? Well, there are two flows here. The first one is registration. Um, the second one is authentication or login. <clears throat> so the Relying party will actually serve a registration page to the client, and that page includes some JavaScript code. This code will execute when the user clicks the register button. And in that code, there is a call to a function that's defined in the WebAuthn uh, JavaScript API. And that function is implemented by the web browser and it will call the authenticator device. The authenticator device will perform a few checks. Uh, the first one is the user presence check. So it will simply check that the user is physically here so that it cannot be faked uh, doing like a remote attack. And optionally, it will also try to verify that the user is actually the owner of the authenticator. If that works, then the authenticator generates a scoped key pair. So that means that key pair is generated for that specific website or RP, and it can only be used with that specific RP in future logins. And that completely eliminates uh, phishing attacks. The private key is stored on the authenticator and the corresponding public key and an attestation signature, we will see what that is soon, is returned. That goes back to the client's device, which forwards it to the RP. The RP can verify the attestation signature and stores the public key so that it can use it in the future to authenticate the user. Now in the authentication or login flow, similarly, the RP serves a sign-in page that also contains JavaScript code, which executes when the user clicks the sign-in button. And it will do a similar call to one of the methods in the uh, web authentication API which calls the authenticator, does the user presence and user verification checks. 
If that works, it returns not an attestation, but an assertion signature that's produced using the private key that we generated in the registration step. That is returned to the client's device. It is forwarded to the RP, which can verify that assertion signature using the public key that it stored during registration. And if that works, the user is successfully authenticated. So what are the main responsibilities for the three actors? So first, the authenticator device, it has to perform the user presence check to check that the user is physically there. Usually the user does that by simply tapping the authenticator to prove that he is physically present. Optionally, if the authenticator device supports it, it will also perform a user verification check, either by using a, a PIN that the user must know and have set before, or a biometric uh, fingerprint or face. Um, also note that these checks are done client side, so on the authenticator and not on the RP. And we will see how the RP can trust those, uh, that those checks were done uh, soon. The authenticator generates and stores the credentials and it produces two types of signatures, attestations during registration and assertions during uh, authentication or login. Now the client, um, it simply acts as a proxy between the authenticator and the RP, but it may do a few other uh, small things. Imagine if you have multiple accounts on the same website and your authenticator device does not have a built-in screen, then it's the responsibility of the client device to display an account selection uh, dialogue, let's say. And finally, the RP, it will verify both types of signatures. It will check that the parameters passed in the first place match what he receives in the end. It will store the public keys. It generates uh, and verifies a random challenge to prevent replay attacks. And it makes a decision whether it wants to authenticate the user or not. Um, and we will see how that is made. So we mentioned attestations and assertions, but first attestations, why do we need them? So that is a way for the relying party to actually trust the authenticator device and to be sure that the data that's produced or returned by the authenticator really comes from that specific model of authenticator and that it's not a fake one. That is achieved because there is a pre-established chain of trust. And if the RP trusts the authenticator device, then it can verify what's the security level of that specific device and know some characteristics about that device and actually make a decision based on those characteristics. That also means that, for example, the user verification check that is done client side, if it's done, the authenticator will set a flag in the response and say that the user verification flag, um, check was performed. So if the RP trusts that data, it means it is pretty sure that uh, the check was done client side for real. We need to know that those attestations are actually optional, but it is very recommended to implement them. And those uh, attestations are created, as I said, during registration. And the signature is computed over the concatenation of two things. The first one is the authenticator data, and the second is a hash of the client data. 
The authenticated data contains the public key that was generated, a unique ID for that um, authenticator device model, and flags such as whether user presence checks or user verification checks were performed and a few other things. And the client data contains um, the challenge that is used to prevent replay attacks and uh, the server origin, so the domain name of the RP, plus a few other things. These attestations can be of different types. And if you choose a different attestation type, there is a different trust model associated to it. These types are the ones that are defined in the spec. So there is basic attestation, self-attestation, ATTCA, uh, ECDAA is elliptic curved based direct anonymous attestations. And you can also uh, say none. So that means you don't want to use attestations at all. We will only go through the first two types because the, the other two are actually more difficult to implement securely and less used in practice. So first, basic attestations. So how does it work? So basically, um, an attestation private key is burnt in at factory and uh, the corresponding public key is bundled in a certificate, and that certificate is part of a chain of trust of certificates, and um, so that we can establish a common root of trust, and so that the RP can check those uh, signatures that are, that are produced with that attestation private key. If we were to put the same private attestation key in um, sorry, I mean, if we were to put different at private attestation keys for each device that is produced, each authenticator, we would have a privacy problem here. Because imagine if you have multiple RPs that uh, talk to each other, they could actually track the users because they have each a different public key. So to avoid that, it's recommended to have um, a batch of authenticator devices of the same uh, model that share the same attestation private key so that you have a, um, a good compromise between privacy and impact in case that attestation private key is leaked. Um, so about that leak, what, what would happen if the, the attestation private key is compromised? Well, it would mean that the RP is not able anymore to distinguish between a true, let's say a true YubiKey 5, which is a specific model of authenticators, and a fake one that I could have built myself and that uses that leaked private key. So you cannot guarantee anymore that there is no, let's say, backdoor that accepts any pin inside of that modified device. The other type of attestation is self-attestation. So that one, um, it will produce the signature using the private key that's generated during registration. So it's a bit like self-signed certificates. And that means it proves nothing about um, if the authenticator is really the model it claims to be. So what's the best attestation type? Um, so I know we did not go through ATTCA and ACDAA, but on paper, ACDAA looks like the one that would provide the best features and security, but it's really difficult, I would say, to implement securely. And uh, in practice, not everyone is going to need that security level, so you may just see people using basic attestation or not using attestations at all. And I think it does not make sense to use the more complex attestation types if your authenticator device does not have, let's say, basic uh, protections against uh, glitching attacks. 
So the other type of signature after attestations is assertions. So the assertion signature is the one that's produced during authentication or sign-in. And uh, unlike the attestation, it is produced using the private key that is generated uh, during registration. And the RP verifies it using the corresponding public key. It's also computed over the same data, the authenticator data and the hash of the client data. But one difference here is that uh, it is possible to use different uh, public key algorithms with uh, assertions. So a quick overview of the APIs. So first, WebAuthN, there are two main methods that you should use here. So there is the create method and the get method. You can use the create method uh, in your JavaScript code if you want to request the authenticator to create a new key pair for registration. When that method is called, it will behind the scenes make a call to the authenticator and request it to produce that key pair. It will return the public key and the attestation. The other method, the get method, um, is the one you use if you want to get an assertion signature that will be produced by the authenticator using the private key that was generated before with the create method. WebAuthn uh, supports a few extensions. It's just something that's good to know. Uh, one use case where you could need extensions is let's say you are implementing the RP and uh, you want to make your decision based on how the user was verified. So you want to know which method the authenticator used to verify the user. Like what did he ask the user to input a pin or did he check his uh, fingerprint? Did he check his face and so on? On the other side, so you have the CTAP2 specification and it also has those two main methods that are corresponding to the WebAuthn methods. So when you call WebAuthn create, it will call make credential on the authenticator. And when you call WebAuthn get, it will call get assertion on the authenticator. CTAP also offers a few other operations. Um, you can get some info about the authenticator that's connected. You can manage the pin. You can completely reset the device, uh, removing all the keys that were generated. And CTAP currently uh, is in uh, CTAP 2.0. That's the latest stable version. But there is a draft uh, specification that is uh, soon going into stable that is going to add two more commands. The first is a way for the user to manage the, um, the let's say, the fingerprints, if you want to add a fingerprint or remove one from the, the authenticator. And Another command is for managing the credentials. So you could say, um, I want to know how many keys were generated on my device, or I want to remove a key pair from the device. There is also a range of commands that are reserved for vendors so that they can implement custom commands. And like uh, WebAuthn, CTAP also offers extensions, but at the moment there is only one that is uh, defined in the spec, the HMAC secret extension. One way you could use that is um, you could implement a password manager. That's something I've done. And uh, that extension allows you to derive a secret from a private key that you generated on your authenticator. So you could use that secret to symmetrically encrypt or decrypt your secrets. Another thing uh, that is used in FIDO2, uh, that's the FIDO metadata service or the MDS. So what is it? It's a public database 
where vendors can publish information about their uh, authenticator product, such as um, some characteristics about it and like the that defined how secure it is or some features that it supports. The RPEs should regularly download all of that info from the MDS so that they can build a local uh, list of characteristics about those existing products and uh, so that they can take a decision when someone logs in with such a device. Otherwise, then as an RP, you don't know anything about that device. You don't know its characteristics. Also, another thing that you can know from the MDS is, for example, we talked about basic attestations and there are those attestation private keys. If that key is compromised, then the vendor would publish a status update to the MDS to let users know that that specific model has been compromised. And then RPs can take a decision if such a device is used. Um, all of that data in the MDS cannot directly be accessed. So you must request an access token, which needs to be renewed yearly to download that data. What exactly can you get from there? So if you download that data, you get a list of those devices. Uh, you get the unique ID of the device. You get the list of status reports, like was it, uh, is it fine? Was the, the attestation private key compromised? And you get a link to download more info about that specific device. When you download that, you will get the name of the device, a short description, just some text, and you will get the attestation root certificates. So the, that's the one of the important parts, I would say. So this is how the RP can establish that root of trust that we talked about before. You, all, you can also know like what uh, methods does the authenticator support for verifying the user? Like, does it have a fingerprint reader on it? Does it support pins? Uh, does it recognize faces? I don't know, does it have a camera? Um, it will also tell you like how the keys are stored on the authenticator. Are they stored on a TPM, for example? You're also gonna get some info um, the, the overall cryptographic strengths of the device. So that's just a number that kind of summarizes how secure the device is. You should not use just that number, but sh you should definitely uh, look at the other characteristics as well. And you also get a list of the um, supported public key algorithms supported by that device, plus a few other characteristics uh, that you can look up in the spec. So what about security measures that are implemented in FIDO2? There is one thing in, uh, in the CTAP specification. Uh, actually, the authenticators should implement a counter that increases every time the user wants to get an assertion signature, so every time they want to log in. And that counter is sent to the RP. The RP must save that counter value. And if an attacker, let's say, clones the authenticator device, then those two counters will start to diverge. And at some point, if they are used for login, the RP will see that the counter is not always increasing. So if that happens, the RP knows that something wrong is going on and it may take a decision like just notifying the user or not uh, accepting login. There is also a maximum number of failed pin attempts that you can do if you use the pin. If you fail the pin uh, too many times, the maximum is eight times, then the authenticator is completely locked and you must reset it. And that means you lose all the keys that were uh, generated on the device. To prevent an attacker from making malicious uh, failed pin attempts, there is um, 
a protection here and if the pin is failed three times then you must remove uh, the device like disconnect it and replug it so that you prove that you are physically present there the keys that are generated are scoped to an rp so that means if you register you generate a key pair it's only valid for that site it cannot be used on other sites and that completely removes uh, all phishing attacks and finally you also get physical theft protection if you use uh, multi-factor authentication so if you also set a pin or a biometric on your authenticator another thing that is possible to integrate with FIDO2 is token binding. So if you've never heard of token binding, that's defined in an RFC. And it's a way to prevent session hijacking. So imagine you have a secret, such as uh, your session cookie or, I don't know, an OAuth uh, token. You can bind it to a specific TLS connection so that even if an attacker steals your session cookie, it will not be able to use it because he will connect with another TLS connection and the server will see that something wrong is going on. In practice, that's not used because web browsers uh, do not support it. Edge used to support it and Chrome as well, but in the latest version of Edge, they moved to the Chrome engine and Chrome also dropped support. Uh, so it's very limited at this point. If you are going to use it, um, you just need to know that the token binding ID can be specified in the client data in FIDO2. So how is FIDO2 being adopted at the moment? Um, for the passwordless use case, there is only Microsoft.com accounts that I know of that implement FIDO2 passwordless login. And you must set your user agent to edge on Windows uh, for them to even display you the option to sign in using FIDO2 passwordless. So hopefully you implement it and your site um, enlarges this list. And if you are going to implement FIDO2 passwordless on your website, please uh, let your users know that you support it by using one of those uh, iMark logos and putting them on the login form. For the 2FA use case, uh, there's many sites that support it. And previously with U2F, many websites uh, implemented it. And it's pretty easy to move from U2F to WebAuthN because it's backwards compatible in the uh, second factor use case. For CTAP only, um, I know of OpenSSH that added in version 8.2 a way for you to generate an SSH key that is stored on a FIDO2 compatible device. WebAuthn is supported on all major web browsers on desktop and mobile. And uh, CTAP2 can be used using the regular uh, transport channels, uh, USB, NFC, Lightning. If you, are, if you have an, uh, an iPhone, you will need an iPhone 7 or later if you are going to use NFC. And uh, on desktop, USB is your best bet. A few examples of platform authenticators that exist already today. So if you have a MacBook, let's say, with a touch bar and that has touch ID, that is a platform FIDO2 authenticator. That's all you need. If you have an Android 7 Plus smartphone, it is a FIDO2 authenticator. And if you have a Windows machine with Windows Hello configured, that is a FIDO2 platform authenticator as well. Soon in iOS 14 and uh, macOS um, Big Share that were recently announced, they will also add uh, that feature and those any devices running those OSs will be FIDO2 platform authenticators as well. 
If you're going to implement it, there are many existing libraries, both for client side. So if you just want to do CTAP to the authenticator or server side, if you want to implement an RP, you should definitely pull entries from the MDS to build that list of characteristics locally and build your trust store and do not blacklist vendors. So it's not a good idea to say, oh, you're not using a YubiKey. Well, I don't want to accept that login. You should really uh, look at the actual characteristics. So is the password problem solved? Well, you don't need to choose, remember, or change passwords anymore. The uh, protocol um, prevents password reuse because it generates a new key pair for every account and every website. It's completely invulnerable to phishing and it's a strong protection against network attacks. So it makes a pretty strong case here, I believe. A few takeaways. So you should always register a backup authenticator so that if uh, you lose it, it gets stolen, it breaks, you are not locked out of your account, you still have another one to log in and you can revoke the, the other authenticator. You should also make sure to set a pin or a biometric or your, on your authenticator to prevent uh, theft attacks. You could tell me but you're just replacing the password with a pin, but that is not true because the password is sent over the network and is vulnerable to all network attacks. And the pin is local. It doesn't need to be changed as often. It cannot be brute forced. If you still don't like pins, you can still use a biometric instead. So Philo2 is still young. Uh, CTAP 2.1 is on the way. There's few websites that implement the passwordless scenario at the moment. So please add support for it and use attestations if possible. If you'd like to learn more about this, I wrote a blog post series on the Kudelski uh, security research blog. There is a live demo on webauthn.io that you can use to test, uh, let's say with your uh, Android phone that's in your pocket. If you just want a quick intro to FIDO2, you can go to loginwithfido2.com and it will explain uh, the basics really well. For more info, there's the last two links and otherwise you can still refer to the official WebAuthn and uh, CTAP specifications. Thank you and uh, the floor is open for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have got time for one or two questions. And uh, effectively, we have two questions in the QA, Q a So just read it. And if you can answer, Niels, <laughs> there <laughs> you go. OK, so the first question is uh, big tech companies such as Google, Facebook, and so on. Um, are pushing this specification, do you think that uh, it's going to get traction from the web mainstream websites, uh, public and private sector? So I would say, I hope so. Um, Microsoft already implemented it for Microsoft.com accounts and it's still young, but I think starting from this year, we've seen uh, support for more and more platforms. And um, I believe by the end of the year, it's just going to work out of the box on kind of all mainstream devices. So we just need more developers to implement it basically. So support is here. So it's, we just need to see whether developers want to uh, support it or not, or if they think their users will benefit from it. There is another question. Okay, so the question is, does OpenSSH really support FIDO2? I thought it only supported FIDO U2F, not FIDO2. So yes, uh, but it only supports the CTAP2 part. So basically it will allow you to generate an SSH key and that SSH key is actually implemented as a private key that's generated on the FIDO2 authenticator. And when you want to log in, you will need to plug in your FIDO2 authenticator or use a platform authenticator if you have one to log in using that SSH key. So yes, it, it does support the, the CTAP2 authenticators. 
Perfect, and uh, we have got a last question. Uh, so just mark uh, them, uh, answer live, please, uh, Nils, so mm -hmm. they will disappear. Thank you. So the last question is, what are main evolutions between CTAP1 and CTAP2.1? So basically, CTAP1 is just U2F uh, renamed. So in CTAP2, you have a new format that is used. So the messages are encoded in CBOR. But previously, it was another uh, binary format that was used in U2F. And in CTAP 2.0 and CTAP 2.1, you have more operations that can be uh, performed. So the spec um, is quite different, actually. Perfect. Uh, perfect on time, Niels. Uh, so uh, the, the goal is rich. Thank you very much for this talk. Thank you. And now we are going to switch uh, to our uh, second talk uh, in this uh, secure identity uh, track. Uh, we are going to welcome uh, Clément, uh, not for the concert first. We have got a technical talk about uh, understanding uh, management of uh, password policy under OpenLDAP. So uh, Clément, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, thank you. Um, hope you hear me. You hear me, and you see the slide. It's all okay. Yeah, yeah yes. everything is okay. great. Uh, so um, we we just had a, a very nice talk uh, about why uh, passwords uh, are uh, a mess. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my talk is about passwords. Um, I really uh, totally agree with the. Uh, previous talk, uh, but mine will try to give some help to, to people that uh, still need uh, passwords and uh, still need to manage them. And uh, we will focus on the password policy in OpenLDAP. So in OpenLDAP, um, which is a, a, an open source uh, LDAP directory, you can uh, do something to uh, have a better uh, control on user passwords. Um, so a, a quick uh, a quick view on who am I. Um, I work for a French company, uh, which is called uh, Vortex. And um, when I work, I'm doing free software. So you, you can maybe see um, the list here. You have a uh, Lemon Adapt, uh, Adapt to Box, uh, Adapt synchronization connector, uh, Fusion IAM, and W Suite. So mostly uh, identity management softwares. And uh, when I don't work, uh, I'm doing uh, music. So thanks, Christophe, for introducing the concert uh, tomorrow. Hope uh, some of you will be there uh, for this. Uh, I'm also uh, playing in a, in a show on YouTube, and uh, I'm doing a theater improvisation. Uh, so um, let's be back to our uh, subject, which is the password policy. Um, before talking about the uh, implementation of the policy inside OpenLDAP, I will talk about the, the policy inside, uh, about the standard of uh, password policy standard. So uh, it is uh, in uh, an ETF uh, draft, uh, very old, because the first version wa was published uh, the last millennium. And uh, the last version uh, is more than 10 years ago and is still tagged as a draft, which means that uh, it is not an official standard of uh, EATF. But uh, even, if it, uh, it is, uh, even if it is uh, expired, um, this, um, this draft is used in many LDAP directories. So we consider it as a standard. Um, these specifications cover many points. Uh, the first is how uh, you design the control request and response. We'll see, we will see this uh, just after. And um, for people designing LDAP directories, the standard uh, also defined the LDAP schema to use to store password policy configurations. 
uh, it explains what are the uh, operational attributes that needs to be used uh, for password policy and what are the steps to, to pass to process to uh, password control. So you see there uh, that we have two main operations in which the password policy uh, is involved. The first one is the authentication. So we will uh, act on password when a user submitted to authenticate. And uh, the second operation is the password modification. So we will act on the password while uh, the, P the user wants to change it. So a little uh, schema, you can see there uh, that uh, we have a, a client and a server. So the client is not the end user itself. Of course, it is a, an LDAP client. Uh, the LDAP client is doing um, an LDAP operation. So as we just said, this operation can be an authentication operation. So LDAP bind, or it can be an modification, LDAP modify, and uh, you do the operation as a client and you set uh, a control, an additional field, which is called a, an LDAP control, uh, without any value. You just say, okay, I'm the client and I want to apply uh, the password policy control. And the server receives the operation. So the first, uh, first things the server is doing is to uh, answer to the operation. And then the server sees that the client knows how to handle password policy. So uh, the server will be able to uh, send back the control response. And as you can see, the control response is a, a complex structure with uh, many flags and uh, return values that will uh, allow the LDAP client to have information about the password status of the user. If you don't have uh, any password policy control, uh, the LDAP client will only know if the password is good or bad, or if the password was accepted for modification or refused for modification. But without the control, uh, the client will have no information why the authentication was of use or why the uh, modification was of use. The goal of the password policy is to give some status, uh, some information to the end user to know why the, the password was refused. So you can see, for example, you can refuse the authentication because your account is already locked. So even if you have uh, the good password, because your account is locked, uh, even uh, using a good password, you, you will not be able to authenticate. So this is uh, one of the example of the password policy. Um, what it is uh, really done at authentication is, is uh, the following. The first thing the server is checking is the expiration. So if you have um, a maximal age of your password on the server side, the server will refuse to authenticate if, if your password is too old. So uh, it means uh, you will be not be able to authenticate uh, with your password, even if your password is a good password. Um, your account can also be locked. So it means uh, an administrator could have locked your account because the administrator don't want that your account uh, be active uh, anymore. Or uh, maybe uh, an attacker has tried too many things, uh, too many times to, to use a password on your account and your account was locked. It's to prevent a brute, brute force attacks. Uh, so if your account is locked, you can't uh, authenticate either. Um, the third check is, uh, are you forced to change your password after the authentication? So we will back on this because it's a complex uh, use case. Um, but when you authenticate to an LDAP server uh, with password policy, the LDAP server can say, okay, your, your password is correct, but uh, you are forced to change it. Uh, no. And the last thing is uh, to send back some warnings. Uh, the, the possible warnings in password policy are, the, are the, the time before expiration. So it means, okay, your, your password is valid, but uh, it will expire in uh, one week, for example. And another thing are the, the authentication graces. So it's a specific feature of password policy. 
uh, an authentication grace is uh, a, a way to be able to authenticate even if your password is expired. So as the first point, I, I said, okay, your password is too old. It is expired. You can't uh, authenticate anymore. It's not perfectly true because if your administrator uh, allows, uh, for example, two authentication graces, you can have an uh, expired password and be able to authenticate two more times. Uh, the goal is, uh, is to be able to change your password after uh, the password expiration. And for modifications, it's very classical. So you, you can check the password size, uh, the password minimal age. Um, so you, you can be a, um, forced to, uh, your, your password, sorry, your password can be refused because you change it uh, in the last hour. So maybe your administrator wants not that you, you are you to be able to change your password uh, every hour, for example. And the uh, uh, third, third point is the password history. It means we can keep a list of your old password. Of course, uh, they are hashed uh, in the history. So we can keep the, the, the password history. So you, you are not able to reuse an old password that you already used. And um, the last point is the password complexity. But for this, a standard uh, do, does not uh, give any clue about what should be done by the server. It means that uh, every uh, LDAP directory can implement uh, its own complexity check. So most of time, complexity checks are about uh, lowercase, uppercase digits, etc. So here is the standard, but how it really works in OpenLDAP. Uh, OpenLDAP uh, has two major versions for, for now. Uh, the current major version is 2.4, um, which is uh, the current version since 10 years now. And it implements the version 9 of the draft. And uh, OpenLDAP team is currently working on the next major version, uh, which is 2.5 and is including the latest version of the, the draft inside this uh, new version. So for the moment, if you install OpenLDAP, you will only have the password policy features that are described in the version 9 of the password policy draft. Uh, what could you expect by switching to the, the new uh, version? Uh, they added the maximum password size so in the, the version 9, you can define the minimum password size. In the version 10, you, you can have the maximum password size. They introduce the authentication delay. It means that you uh, will delay the authentication if you uh, have some failure on, on the password. The idle time is a way to uh, be able to compute uh, the time before the last uh, authentication on the, on the account. So it means if your last authentication was uh, the, the previous year, uh, we can say that your account was not used uh, uh, anymore. And so if you come back one year later, you, you cannot authenticate with your account. And uh, the validity period is uh, also a new feature. You, you can directly put some dates so, so a start date and end date in your uh, user account to uh, to be able to say, okay, my account is created, but uh, it is not yet uh, valid. So the user can yet, cannot use it. Um, how it, it, it is configured in OpenLDAP? So maybe some of you know that OpenLDAP can be configured uh, as in uh, with LDF files. Uh, if you don't know it, so you know you know. And you, you just load the overly. Uh, the overly is a, is a simple module of OpenLDAP. So you, you just say, OK, I want to uh, enable the password policy. And you have uh, three, uh, three uh, configuration options. The first one is very important, uh, is uh, that you tell OpenLDAP to hash the password uh, when it is modified, when it is sent to your directory. The second one is to enable a, a locking. And the last is a, 
a specific options that you just need to uh, enable if you have some slave servers and master servers, if you are doing some replications and you want to uh, forward uh, all the password policy information from the uh, consumers to the providers. You can have uh, many uh, password policies inside an LDAP directory. So each password policy is, uh, is represented as an LDAP entry uh, with a specific object class. Um, you can uh, add a, a specific object class, which is the password policy checker, to uh, load a specific module to check the complexity. So if you need uh, one of this module, the adapted board project uh, is shipping one, which is called PPM, Password Policy Module, which is a, a very good name for a password policy module. And uh, this is an example of a, of a password policy configuration. So you, you see there are a, a lot of uh, parameters. Um, you, you, the, the name of par the parameters are, are very explicit. Uh, so I, I will not explain all, but you see that you can uh, set password max age, uh, which is in, in seconds. Uh, you, you can set um, the, the password max failure. Uh, here you see it's 10, so it means that uh, if you fail 10 times, your account will be locked. Um, you can... Uh, work on, on this parameter by adding the password failure count interval, which uh, here it is uh, uh, 30 seconds. It means that you need to fail 10 times in 30 seconds to lock your account. If you fail 10 times, but in a, another period, your account will not be locked. And the lockout duration, uh, it's, it's also in seconds, so it's 600 seconds, 10, 10 minutes here. Uh, it means that your account will be locked uh, for 10 minutes and after 10 minutes you will be able to uh, log in uh, with, your, with your password your, your account will not be locked anymore so you see that inside the password policy configuration we mixed some parameters that are used to check the authentication step and some parameters like uh, the password uh, mean size uh, or mailings for uh, or the password in story, which are used when you update your password in the LDAP directory. When your password policy is configured, you 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 know uh, have some uh, operational attributes inside each user entries, uh, and these attributes allow allow you to know what is the status of the account of your user. So password policy step entry is uh, a pointer to the active uh, policy for this user. Uh, password change time, uh, the date, the date when the password was changed. The account lock time, the date when the password was locked. The failure time, it's a list of failure. Uh, history is your history. Grace use time is the time when you, you use your, your authentication grace. And the password reset is the flag that uh, will tell your user to uh, update your password. Um, a small uh, word on uh, a second overlay, which is last bind, uh, which you can install on OpenLDAP 2.4. Uh, this overlay um, is used to uh, uh, remember the last authentication date. So in uh, the next major version, this will be included in the password policy overlay. So uh, specific things that uh, no one's tell you and you have to discover yourself. Uh, the first one is account locking. Uh, I just said that you have an attribute in your user entry, which is password account lock time, uh, in which you have the, the date of the password lock. Uh, you, you, you can't trust really this uh, attribute. Uh, on, you, you can't say that uh, your account is locked because you have the attribute, because if the date uh, is greater than the lock time and the lock duration, you still have the attribute in your uh, user entry, but your account is not locked because the, the, the date the date is, is, is no more uh, uh, the one when your account is locked. Uh, the value 
of this attribute is only deleted on the next authentication. So until the password, until the user has no, uh, done any authentication on its own tree, uh, the, the account, the attribute is still in the account, but maybe the account is not locked. And the second point is the password reset. Um, if you ask your password to change the password at next connection, uh, the authentication is still valid because you need to be able to authenticate to, to change your password. So if your application is only doing an authentication, uh, the, this flag will be totally uh, ignored by the application because the authentication is, is still valid. So to, to have a, a, a real use case with this, you need a, an application that will check this, uh, this flag and uh, ask the, the user to change the password after the authentication. So no, you know. Um, to, to conclude this presentation, uh, I would like to introduce a, a small uh, software that I, I, I wrote. It, it is uh, named Service Desk. It's part of the LDAP Toolbox project. So the, the goal is to support your support because a lot of uh, support team uh, are uh, busy with uh, um, issues from users that have lost the password of or uh, if the user uh, has a, an account locked, uh, he don't know that the account is locked and he thinks the, the password is not the, the, good, uh, the good one, etc. So uh, the, the support team uh, needs to know quickly what is the account status and how to solve the user issue. Uh, so this is a, a quite a single uh, page application. Uh, you, you search uh, an account in the directory and then you can see all the um, information of, of the user and all the status of the, the, the account. And you can uh, test the current password. So you, you, you can take the, the user password and, and check if the password is valid. You can reset the password and you can lock or unlock uh, the account. So the, the support team has no other uh, rights on the, on the entry, the only thing in can do is uh, to uh, uh, unlock or change the user password. Um, so quick search, uh, so this, all these features are in the, the current version. So the, the, the latest version is uh, 0.3 and was released uh, two hours ago. So it's a very fresh version. It was released this morning. Uh, you know, so if you want more, uh, some, some uh, links here. And um, I don't know, I think I have some minutes just to, to show you the, the application here. So here is a, the application, is, is my account. So I can uh, check my, my account here. So my authentication succeeds. And um, you can see that my authentication, my authentication date was updated. I can uh, lock my password. So my password is now locked uh, and we can directly see that uh, we, we have some uh, failure here. And if I use the ADAP browser, I will find the, the, same, uh, the same values inside the directory. But of course, it is not easy to, to be able to have this status uh, with an ADAP browser. Uh, it is really easy to, to see it uh, here. And of course, I can unlock the account here if I want, or if uh, I need to lock the account, but permanently, you see it, the account is locked, but for uh, forever. And if you look at this, you will see there, there is the password account lock time that was uh, set inside the entry. And if I unlock and refresh, the uh, value was removed. So this is a, a very easy uh, software, but it implements all the password policy logic from uh, OpenNDAP, and it is now very easy to, uh, to check this uh, policy and to check the user account status with it. Uh, okay, it's over, thank you. Hope, uh, hope this was clear, and uh, I can now answer questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Clément. Thank you. Um, maybe one question uh, I have heard. 
Yes, uh, just just yeah. a quick question. You hear me? Yes. Uh, um, uh, is, uh, does the the draft uh, the, does the draft specify how the the passwords should be stored by uh, the OpenLDAP server or the LDAP server? Uh, the specific I, I don't understand the question. Where they should be stored? Or? I mean, uh, no. Uh, how the passwords are stored in uh, in the server? I mean, um, uh, uh, with uh, which uh, which algorithm? Or protected? Yeah. Yeah, no, the, it is not uh, defined in the, in the draft. Uh, each uh, each uh, LDAP directory can use uh, any uh, hash algorithm that, uh, that he wants, and the password policy does not uh, give any hint about uh, which algorithm you you, you should uh, you should use. You can even uh, store your password in clear text and apply a password policy on it. So it is not incompatible. Okay, it's, it's left to the, um, the administrator. Yes. Um, exactly, it's left to the, to the administrator. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Clément. I, I don't see any other question, so no other answer also. So thank you very much for, uh, for this talk. And uh, we remind that. everybody that you are going to pri provide us a, a concert at uh, 5 uh, 15 tomorrow yes <laughs> so we are going to take a 10 minute pause and uh, before uh, restarting uh, our uh, last um, uh, track uh, with a, um, a talk about uh, free software uh, forensic and uh, well, remote forensic on cloud environment with a uh, google security team and with toma and theo have a, a good pause and uh, we will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Well, the, the song is over, so I think it is time to be back. And uh, as said previously, we are going to start this new session with a new talk, uh, a talk about um, uh, forensic and uh, investigation in a cloud environment with, using free software. So please uh, welcome Thomas and Theo. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having us. Yeah. The stage is yours. All right. Let me try to share my screen. Uh, it is done. It, it's working? Great, because yeah. I, I can't see anything now. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. All right, great. Uh, for, Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for, for having us today. Uh, like Christoph said, we're going to talk about uh, open source cloud forensics tools in different environments. Uh, we call this tool All Your Cloud or Belong, the talk All Your Cloud or Belong to Us because we felt it was funny. <laughs> so these are going to be your hosts today myself, uh, Tom, and Theo, who is with me. We are both working in the DFIR team at Google. Uh, we do incident response and a lot of forensics engineering. Um, we're both based in Zurich. Uh, so far, uh, I'm the DF Time Wolf core developer. Uh, you may have heard of it uh, in the past. It's a small tool. There will be a brief mention of it during this talk. And Theo is the mastermind behind LibCloud Forensics. And this is what this talk will be about. So why, why do we come up with LibCloud Forensics? Because we wanted to do some stuff in the cloud. And as we know, the cloud can be a very unwelcoming environment. So. What were the motivations behind it? First of all, we needed to automate all our cloud investigations because Google being Google, we always have to um, you know, work at scale with a lot of stuff that's going on. So automation is very important for us. Um, in the same vein, we also wanted ready to use investigation environments. So whenever we had an incident that required us to investigate the cloud, we really wanted to have all the tools that we needed right there. Um, manually installing tools takes time. So we really wanted to have the process as streamlined as possible. And also, you know, the cloud is cool because you can have big, beefy VMs in the cloud that are way faster than your workstation. So if you want to process forensics evidence there, uh, then it's really good to have a very big computer in the cloud. Uh, some caveats, though. Uh, we didn't want to reinvent uh, the wheel or to be the Swiss army knife of cloud. We only want to do one thing in cloud and do it well, which is doing forensics. So. The library that we came up with, as we'll, we'll see later, has a very essential functionality and very few dependencies, but just what we need to do all the forensics in the cloud. This is why we came up with LibCloud Forensics. So basically, it's a Python library that allows you to interact with different cloud providers. So GCP, AWS, and Azure for now. It's very lightweight and it's very focused on forensics. So you can use it to do stuff like copying disks, kind of like a DD in the cloud spinning up ready to use analysis VMs and also grabbing all types of logs, whether it's on GCP, AWS, or Azure. Uh, there's a few similar projects that we saw when we started doing this, uh, which is Apache Lake Cloud, which doesn't have a focus on forensics and supports around 30 different types of cloud providers, which is a lot uh, and way more than what we needed. Uh, and also for Steady Security, which is a security project also um, where Google has its collaboration. Um, but it's focused on GCP and has a few of the primitives that we'll see later on, but does, it's not really focused on forensics itself. Uh, the main challenge that we had was to try to come up with a generic enough way to name things in our project so that it kind of makes sense in different cloud architectures. So for instance, what is a disk in GCP is gonna be named a volume in AWS. So we had the choice, we could either try to come up with a common vocabulary or taxonomy that, would, that made sense across all clouds, or we could instead come up with a similar interface for different cloud providers, which is what we ended up doing. Um, we didn't want to have you know, yet another competing standard of how to name things, uh, and rather we stuck with what we knew. 
Uh, anyways, uh, this is enough about the intro. Let's dig into the you know deep code things with Theo. Uh, yep. The screen is yours, I think. Um, yeah, I can control it for now. Let's see again. Yes, yes awesome. it seems to be working. Great. So libcat forensics, in a nutshell, as Tom said, it's a Python 3 library. It comes packaged with a CLI, and it's very easy to install. So for those of you that are familiar with the pip environment, you can just pip install it very easily. Then provided that you have configured authentication with the different cloud providers, libcat forensics will just reuse that and transparently authenticates and interact with the different cloud providers. It's open source, uh, so that's pretty cool. Under Apache to license, um, we will tell you a little more on that later on. Now, this is the library architecture that we came, that we came up with. So each provider has um, a module, and then under each of these modules, you will have a forensics.py file, which exposes higher level forensics functionality, such as creating disk copies, starting analysis VM. Um, and they also all have an internal module, which is where we basically hide all of uh, the cloud provider specific functionality. And um, we also expose primitives for each of these providers uh, that are more internal, such as list instances, list disks, list logs, and so on and so forth. Now let's uh, see how this all works in GCP. So let's say we have the following scenario. We have a Google Cloud Engine instance hosting a content management system that gets owned. Um, so we're going to be wanting a few things. First, we want a forensic copy of the compromised disks that belong to this instance. We also want an analysis VM that is ready to use so that we can forensicate the disk. And ideally, we want this in a separate project. We also probably want a coffee because this is going to be a long investigation. What we really don't want is to do this any of these tasks manually because it's really cumbersome. So if you're familiar with GCP, if you wanted to do a disk copy in there, there are a few steps involved. You would first to have to create a snapshot of the disk in the source project. And then you would have to create a new disk out of this snapshot in the second project. And then you have to you know, create your VM, connect to it, install all the tools you need, um, attach the disk copy that you just created, and then you have to bounce back to the first project and do some cleaning up because you don't want to have all these intermediate resources just laying around. So in this slide, you can see a snippet of code um, that's basically doing all we just said in um, just two function call. So in the first part of the code, you can see how you can create a disk copy in GCP. Um, it should be noted that the parameters you see there are uh, GCP specific and that if you were to do the same in AWS or Azure, some of them might be different. Uh, for GCP, you have to specify the source project, which is the project in which you have your compromised instance. Then you will specify the destination project, which is the one you want to carry analysis on, the instance name, the zone in which this instance is. And then you have an optional disk name parameter, which is uh, pretty useful if you want to investigate one disk in particular, or if you don't specify it, then we'll just grab the boot disk of the instance. So after this first function call, you already have your forensic copy in your analysis project. And then the second part of the code focuses on creating a, an analysis VM. So there again, you specify a bunch of perimeters. Um, the cool thing is that you have a lot of options to customize this VM. So you can choose the boot disk type, the size, the number of CPU cores. As Tom said, if you want a really beefy machine, that's pretty cool. Uh, but more importantly, you can specify a, a source image for the VM. So if you want to use Ubuntu or some other OS, that's up to you. Um, and in particular, you can specify a path to a script that will be executed the first time the machine is put up. So that's pretty useful if you have any pre-processing job to do um, on your VM before you start your investigation. Now, this is what you do in code, but you know, Libcat Forensics also comes with a CLI tool. Um, that's the, um, in, in the slide, you can see all the uh, functions that we have in the CLI for GCP. Um, those are meant to be easy to use and ready to use so that you don't have to write any code. Um, so if we wanted to do exactly what we've done before, but with no code, this is what it would look like. So just to like two one-liners, uh, one to do the copy of the disk 
and want to do um, to start the analysis VM and get started. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, TimeWolf is a very big user of this library because it interacts a lot with cloud. And TimeWolf is basically our forensics pipeline uh, where we use it to make the link between all the different forensics tools that we have. Um, in this case, this is a slide from a previous talk about how Greendale, this fake university, got compromised by attackers. And this is Cyber Forensics Assurances, the consulting company that comes in and helps them. So in green, you have the Greendale IoT Cloud projects. And in blue, you have the incident response project. So a full pipeline usage of this library would look like something like this, where TimeWolf asks the Greendale project to copy the disk, the disk for Jenkins. The new copy is returned. This copy is sent to the uh, response project. And an API call is made to Turbinia saying like, hey, Turbinia, can you please forensicate this for me? Turbinia is going to run Plazo or log to timeline on the disk image and store a Plazo file in a, in a Google storage. And then this will be sent back to TimeWolf, and TimeWolf will send it to TimeSketch for analysis. So this all happens in one CLI command, but where LibCloud Forensics really helps is right at the beginning of the process where all the steps that Theo uh, detailed before, the snapshotting of disks and the moving the snapshot from one project to the other, the creation of a disk, the removal of the initial snapshot, everything is automated and abstracted away. So you as a library user can have all these functionality and it's really embedded into another and bigger uh, forensics pipeline. What about Amazon? Uh, let's take a look at Amazon. So uh, we have a similar story, compromised instance. We have three key differences. Uh, well, we're in AWS, that's one. And then the disk that we want to investigate uses AWS EBS encryption. So for those of you that are not familiar with AWS, EBS encryption is the way Amazon ensures the um, uh, security of your data at rest and in transit between instances and storage. And the third difference is that we want to analyze the disk in a different AWS account. Since we don't have the notion of projects in AWS, this is basically what we have to do if we want any kind of separation between wherever we have our compromised instance and wherever we want to do the analysis. Now, can we do all of this through AWS Web Console? The short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, but you really don't want to, and I'm going to show you why. So in the picture in the slide, you can see what the steps look like if you were to do it manually. The upper part is everything that's happening in the source account. The lower part is everything that's happening in the destination account. The grid circle that's in the slide is the volume that we want to make a copy of. It's encrypted and it's encrypted with the default Amazon key that comes uh, with your account whenever you create um, an AWS account. So the first step is similar. You create a snapshot. But now there is a catch because AWS does not allow you to share the default encryption key that comes with your account. So you have to navigate your way through the UI and go to the key management service and create a temporary customer managed key, which you have to then use to create a copy of the first snapshot, uh, which you will re-encrypt with this temporary key. And after that, you have to share both that copy and that key to the external account, which is the last grid circle. So then you have to log off and then log in at the destination account, create your final volume copy, which will be automatically re-encrypted a third time with your default account key. But that's not it because then you have to log off again, log back in the source account and do some cleanup work. So you have to delete the first snapshot, then delete the key and delete the third snapshot. So things are really getting ugly and it's a long process, very tedious, and it's very easy to make mistakes or to forget to share things. So instead of doing that, you can do it the cool way and just use LibCut Forensics. A one-liner, again, uh, you just reference the volume ID, type your command, launch it, everything will be done for you. So when you launch this command, LibCut Forensics will check if you're trying to make the copy in a separate account, if so, it will also check if you're trying to make a copy of an encrypted volume. And if so, it will generate everything for you. So it will generate a one-time key. It will re-encrypt um, a second copy of the snapshot, share everything with the destination account, connect to it, create the volume, connect back to the first account, clean up everything, and then you're done. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Theo, for, for the insight on that. Um, 
I'm going to anticipate one of the questions that we very often get, uh, which is why, why do you people produce all these code and open source? Well, there's, there's a few good reasons for that, right? Uh, the first one and the main one is we really try to be platform agnostic. So basically that means that we never really know what we're going to do forensics on next. It could be something on GCP. It could be something on Azure. It could be something that is internal from the systems of Google. Uh, it's really hard to know, but we really want to keep make sure that we keep like this agility and that we can adapt. And for that, we need a platform agnostic software. Um, so this is true for all our tools, but for this one in particular, there's another uh, another reason that is really important is that we get more we want more diverse feedback on the usage of the tool. So that means that you know we're pretty heavy users of GCP and less heavy users of uh, AWS, but it could be that someone else who uses this library is a very heavy user of uh, of Amazon Web Services, and you know they will know much better than us how what are the things that they want to see in this library and how how do how do they want to use it how do they want to integrate it with their own tools. Uh, so we're looking for different use cases. We have a very GCP-centric bias, uh, and we're looking to unbias a little bit this, this approach. And we're also looking for different experience with more and other different cloud providers. Uh, and last but not least, we also want to give something back to the community. Uh, we spent all this time writing code. Might as well have other people work on it too, right? Or benefit from it at least. We've also been experimenting a little bit with code review experiments because this... In our team, it's a fairly new library, uh, and the code base is unfamiliar for many people. Uh, so for that, we we've experimented with a little bit a little bit with GitHub code owners, which basically declares um, user accounts and maps it to specific sections of the code where they have, let's say, review authority over. Uh, well, in our case, because this is very preliminary, we are all the main four contributors are all code owners of the whole code base. But the main change that we made was to have two pairs of eyes for each code review. So you might think this makes things way heavier when it comes to code agility, but it doesn't. Because from what we've seen, there's much less reviewer fatigue. So it's not always the same person who reviews the code. We have this rotation going on where we pick two people kind of at random or that are more familiar with some parts of the code base. So there's much less reviewer fatigue because there's no one reviewer that will review all the code or all the pull requests. Um, there's also less pressure on reviewers, because uh, if I come in as a second reviewer, I know that the code has been through a first round of reviews. Um, and if I come in first, then I know that probably the second person will also catch some mistakes that I may have not seen, right? Um, and this also adds a lot of different perspectives on the code and the way it should be fixed when mistakes are made, um, whether it's style or, you know, optimizations. It's really good to be able to learn from your teammates that are also reviewing the same code. Uh, and yeah, you learn a lot from comments that other people make. Um, and last but not least, we also wanted to have a bigger part of the team work on this code base. And this was a bit tricky because we have sites in many time zones. We have sites in the West Coast, in the East Coast, in Zurich, and in Sydney. And getting all these people to work together on the same code base can be a challenge. Um, so naturally, this started off in Zurich uh, but we want to export the knowledge of the code base to other sites um, because if, you know, something happens and we're all sleeping in Zurich and everyone is awake in, in, in Mountain View or in Sydney, then they will have to wait for us to wake up to fix bugs. And that's really not good, especially in an incident response environment where you need to have this agility. So what we want to be able to do is have people who are knowledgeable enough in every site or in at least one of the sites to be able to fix bugs that come up. Uh, we also want to share maintenance responsibilities. So if some people in one side, they just take time off, well, then someone else can come in, fix bugs, write documentation, and so on. And we also want to split code reviews because it's pretty cool to be able to say, I wrote some code uh, on a Friday evening, and then I just want to you know, have it reviewed and ready to go by Monday. And then maybe people in Sunnyvale can take over uh, their shift and review the code, and then I can keep working on it on Sunday morning, and I don't have to wait for the for the whole team to review it when they're in the same time zone as me. So that's that's also pretty good. We also try to make a lot of efforts in our continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. Uh, so you may think CI and CD is really a software engineer thing, but let me assure you it's not. I don't consider myself a software engineer, more of a security engineer, because I like to focus on features that my code does and how it helps me tackle the problems that I have. I care a little about coding structure and things, it's important, but what I want to focus on is features, right? So 
by this, I want to automate as much of the quality assurance as possible. Um, so I want to have my tests run every single time that I receive a pull request. And this is super important because you want to be able to merge with confidence, right? You want to be able to say, well, I'm going to merge this code into my main code base. And I want to have a certain amount of confidence that it's not going to break everything. So that's pretty good to have unit tests. And we use GitHub Actions for that. And it's been really good so far. Um, we're also using end-to-end -end, uh, testing through Jenkins. And that's also pretty good because it allows us to detect API changes early. I mean, Liptop Forensics is all about interacting with APIs that we have little control over. So, um, you know, you don't want to wait until you're in the middle of an incident response just to find out that an API method that you were relying on has been deprecated. You want to know this early on, and it has already caught a few things that were really good to have uh, and to fix early on before we're using it in an incident. This is an awesome sticker, by the way. So they ship everywhere. Um, about code quality. Uh, so we use type hinting a lot, which is a new feature in Python 3. It makes Python a little less yellow and allows you to have a little more structure when you try to specify types and things. Um, it makes things a little bit more consistent, and it will also catch a lot of errors very early on. Um, we also have linter checks, and linter checks allow us to have a certain type of consistency across the entire code base uh, because you know there's like five people working on this code base and we all have different coding styles some people come from java some people come from go and it's fine i don't judge but you know i like to have my code consistent and at least be not be able to obviously tell who wrote this function so linters help us a lot with that and we also have a style guide that we follow uh, we also try to work a lot on documentation we have very verbose doc strings and that will hopefully be very helpful uh, when we decide to generate all the docs uh, for our code, which we haven't done yet. We also started off having an examples directory, which turned out to be so useful that we decided to turn it into a CLI script directory because this was exactly how you were supposed to use uh, the code. We also make heavy use of GitHub issues. Uh, there's a very big culture in our team to please open issues every time you have an idea or a bug or something that you want to write down so as not to forget it, just open an issue and then someone will triage it and label it. And to triage issues, we use labels. Um, as you can see in the screenshot there, uh, we have labels for GCP, an enhancement label, which is basically a feature request label. We have Azure. We also have testing. We have documentation. We also have a good first issue label. And that's really useful because newcomers to the code base that want to contribute, uh, they may want to have easy things to tackle first. So this allows us to say like, hey, maybe take a look at this issue first. And you know that will give you, it's not really challenging, but it will give you a good overview of how the code base is. Um, we also try to maintain a public discussion. It's not very easy uh, because we're all in our internal messaging tools and you know Google already has a bunch of them. We don't want another one, but uh, we really try to keep the discussion in issues and pull request comments and so on. Uh, we also have a Slack channel where you can find us if you're ever using this. Uh, there's a link right there. The link is a GitHub link, but the GitHub link has a link to the app to add you to the Slack channel. So follow that if you want. Uh, we'll repost the link later on, and it will be in the slides anyways. Um, what about a roadmap? What's what's the future for LibCloud Forensics? Well, we have a GitHub project page, which is the screenshot that is here, it's part of the project page, where we try to put what everyone is working on so that people can have an idea. And by people, I mean us for now, because I guess uh, we're the, the people who have the most interest in knowing. We have a horizontal roadmap, which is basically support basic functionality, but for more cloud providers. And we're currently working on Azure. Um, but you know, if, if this is something that you're interested in, then maybe you can contribute for your own cloud provider. Um, we also have the vertical roadmap, which is, support more features for a single cloud provider. So for instance, more disk operations in GCP to have, for example, an instance disk become a DD image, that could be useful. Um, and also more granular support for logs, like for example, all the logs that GCP supports, but also uh, CloudTrail from Amazon and all the other logs that they support. Um, and we also wanna focus heavily on community. So uh, I'm trying to come up with a contributor's guide that I hope to publish soon. Uh, and we also want to focus heavily on documentation so that people who want to use something like this can do so very easily. Uh, the link below is a link to our GitHub project page. You can also find it through the repo if you click on the projects tab. And that is that is about it for us.
Uh, thanks for listening so far. If you have to remember one thing, remember that Lib Cloud Forensics is a thing that can help you do forensics in your cloud providers. Uh, and here are all the links you may want and need from this presentation. So we talked about Time Wolf, Turbinia, which are tools that we use uh, every day, and then the Slack channel and the blog are right there. And the blog has been pretty active recently, and we published a few um, a few articles about Lib Cloud Forensics, but also our other tools. So if you're curious about what we're doing, feel free to have a look. And I guess we can take questions now. Effectively, uh, we have got uh, some much. time, so we can applause first. <laughs> and um, effectively, we have got one question up there. Where, where do I see it? Where well, you can, you can uh, probably read it. You can loud, take but... the question in the Q&A uh, query button. In the interface, yeah, zoom interface. You can read it out if you want. Yeah, I, it, it'll, the, the interface disappeared. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, can... uh, I will read it out. It says uh, we will be able to choose parsers while running Plasso. That's the question. Or all parsers will be run automatically with Plasso. Okay, so that's that's a really good question. Not about LibCloud forensics, but I can still answer it. Uh, <laughs> So you can select what Plasma versions to use, uh, Plasma parsers to use when you run Plasma. But I assume this question is more about how Turbinia decides to run Plasma and which parsers it decides to run. So one of the features that Aaron, who is working on Turbinia, is working on right now is to have some sort of recipes with which you can launch Turbinia. And in that case, you could say, hey, Turbinia, I want you to run Plasma, but I only want you to run very specific parsers or basically run Plaza with these options. Um, just like you could have, please export it to time sketch, but only run these specific analyzers, or maybe even, you know, just run Plaza and don't run strings on the whole disk. Uh, so yes, this is customizable in Turbinia. In Plaza, it's already a thing, so you can just pick the parsers that you want. Uh, and Turbinia will soon be implementing this recipe mechanism, which is a little bit more complex. Any other one question? Uh, I can read it. I think it is a kind of troll, but you have to. <laughs> we have to deal with. I will. I will play. <laughs> I will play along. Uh, tip hinting makes Python less YOLO. Why use Python at all if you want type safety? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, I don't think type safety is something that we want. It's always good to have it. Uh, I think, and it's something that Python really lacks. Uh, but the main question is why, I guess, why are we using Python if we could be using any other thing? Uh, the, main, the, main, the main reason is because all our other tools are already Python. For example, DF Time Wolf is already Python. Uh, so importing libcloud forensics would be very easy uh, in Time Wolf and in all the other tools that we use. So let's say that this is our code base that is maybe the cleanest in that way with type hinting. So yeah. Okay. I, I can actually see the questions now, so that's much better. Yeah, perfect. But there's no questions anymore. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe one more. Uh, yeah. uh, if, if, you, uh, if you run uh, uh, yourself your, the, the forensic analysis, uh, can, can you give us an idea on uh, what scale uh, or how many uh, cloud instances, uh, you can uh, um, actually uh, uh, examine or analyze with uh, with these tools at once. Well, what is the scale? Okay. What is the goal in terms of scale? <clears throat> OK, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so the goals in terms of scale are to be able to scale, right? Um, for now, it is true that we haven't considered uh, parallelizing LibCut forensics. Uh, or its functionality, but the main time sink in doing this won't be situated in the in the cloud forensics library. It will be more waiting on the GCP uh, on the GCP platform to uh, actually do the actions, right? Uh, so in that way, it would be fairly easy for us to just you know thread the um, the cl the CLI invocation in a bash script or something. So that that would work. On the other hand, Turbinia and TimeSketch are really made 
to uh, to be able to to scale a lot. And Turbinia can deal with a lot of uh, disks at the same time. It's like running Plazo in the cloud, but on a very, very beefy VM, right? And Time Sketch can also deal with uh, hundreds of timelines at the same time. So these two other tools are really made to scale. And Time Wolf is made to uh, orchestrate all these tools between them. So yeah. OK. Uh, Theo, did you have something to add to the typing question? Because I saw that t the, the notification said that you would answer something. Oh, yeah, I was just clicking buttons. Um... But ah, okay. I guess it would be worth adding. Um, it also just helps us catch mistakes uh, because Python being Python, sometimes just write things and you might overwrite variables or whatever and then pass to some function, something that's really not expected. Um, and so rather, instead of uh, waiting that it just um, explodes when you're actually running the tool, we, we can just use type hinting to help us catch this earlier and just make sure our um, tools are safe to use, so to speak. Okay, so no more question uh, in the audience. We have got uh, around 10 minutes ahead, so we can stand by and take uh, another pause, or uh, we can also switch to uh, IRC if you want to chat uh the the question on python uh, uh has been uh, asked uh at the first time on freenode so <laughs> all right I, I can i can join the irc channel and, and deal with yeah. the trolls over there it's fine <laughs> yeah it's okay it's okay so we take a, a nine minute pause uh before the the last talk uh with tom about frida and uh, qbda so see you there. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, Christoph, the unmute point. Yeah, it's better <laughs> if I unmute. So thank you, Philip. Uh, well, we are back for uh, our last talk of uh, this afternoon. We are going to welcome uh, Tom Cheka from uh, uh, Quark's lab, uh, talking about uh, combined advantages uh, of uh, Frida and QBDI on Android. Uh, Tom, the stage yep. is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. OK, cool. OK, so let's um, share my screen first. Uh, can you see my screen? I hope so. Yes, uh, full screen uh, for the moment uh, with slides. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how Frida and QBDI can be used uh, together to make reverse engineering easier on uh, Android. So uh, first of all, quick introduction, who am I? Uh, I'm Tom, I work as a security engineer at Quark's Lab, which is a security company based in Paris. Uh, I'm mainly interested in stuff related to Android, like reverse engineering, um, instrumentation, fuzzing and uh, tooling. Yeah, so that's pretty much all for me. Um, before we get started, uh, I will give you some background about uh, Android uh, reverse engineering. Uh, for some of you, it may be something you already know, but uh, I want to make sure that everyone is okay with this concept before, uh, I mean, uh, uh, digging into uh, the following parts. Uh, okay, uh, so let's begin with uh, Android uh, application ecosystem. So Android programmers develop their application in either Java or Kotlin languages. Uh, then this code is compiled into Dalvik bytecode. Uh, if you're interested in uh, knowing what this bytecode is about, you can have a look online. Um, after that, the bytecode is stored in uh, DEX files, uh, which stand for Dalvik executable. And uh, finally, uh, these files are uh, embedded in the, fin the, the final APK file, which uh, basically represent the, the application. Uh, when it comes to running the application, uh, this code needs to be executed. So before Android 5, uh, it was done uh, thanks to a virtual machine uh, called uh, Dalvik VM. But since uh, performances weren't that good, uh, it was next replaced by another approach uh, called Android uh, Runtime, which consists of compiling ahead of time the Dalvik bytecode into machine code, which can be uh, executed, ex executed uh, natively on the CPU. Uh, regarding reverse engineering, uh, there are some tools out there, uh, such as uh, JDX and APK tool. Uh, to help you read through uh, a human readable uh, representation of the code. Uh, yeah, that way you can retrieve something that uh, really looks like the, the original code. Uh, on top of that, Android, um, I mean, especially Java, uh, provides an interface to allow developer to write and call a native code from the, from the Java side. Uh, this mechanism is called uh, Java Native Interface, which is often just uh, shortened uh, GNI. Uh, technically speaking, uh, the code is put into a shell library, which is embedded in the APK file and is loaded into memory at runtime. Uh, so now uh, reverse engineering is uh, more difficult because uh, you, need, you need to deal with uh, native code. Okay, uh, so now uh, let's pretend uh, you're a developer and you want to protect your encryption function, uh, which is basically a simple XOR function because you're really good at uh, cryptography. Uh, you can see that uh, when you decompile um, the, the Dalvik bytecode into Java representation with JDX, uh, everything remains uh, pretty much the same except uh, function and variable names. Uh, it's mostly due to ProGuard, which is uh, an, an optimizer which provides uh, minimal protection against uh, reverse engineering. So uh, that's not a, a really great idea to write sensitive function like that because an attacker could understand it uh, without effort. Um, okay, so now let's uh, shift this function to the native side. 
so of course uh, you need to pass uh, buffer length in arguments, but the, the logic is pretty much the same. Uh, we can try to compile it and see what the life, the, the graph uh, looks like uh, in the disassembly. Okay, so if you choose not to use an obfuscator, uh, we can more or less easily understand what this function is doing. Uh, I mean, uh, at the top of the function, we, uh, the, the first basic block uh, is presumably responsible for initialization. Then we clearly see a loop uh, with the loop condition. Uh, on the left, the processing block, which contains the, the XOR instructions. And on the right, the epilog of the function. Uh, now, uh, with obfuscation, uh, it's like much more complicated to understand uh, what's going on because, I mean, at least statically, because uh, OLLVM used uh, some obfuscation technique like flattening to scramble the, the control flow. So it's just a pain to understand uh, that this function is actually a simple XOR encryption. So uh, we need uh, another approach. Uh, we can uh, still uh, try to understand what this function is doing uh, dynamically uh, with a debugger like GDB or LLDB. Uh, there's many techniques uh, out there to detect the presence of ptrace and developers often rely on them to protect their application from uh, being debugged by attackers so it's not really uh, practicable oh. okay uh, so now uh, let's introduce frida uh, i suppose most of you uh, already know frida especially if you're into uh, mobile security uh, basically, Frida is a GBI toolkit uh, which allows a uh, user to inject uh, some code into a process. Uh, in the context of Android, it's a rather application. Uh, unlike debuggers, uh, only injection relies on ptrace, so it's harder for a process to notice uh, it's being, it's being uh, inspected. Uh, but for example, you can inject uh, the Frida library on your own without using the injector. Uh, Frida is uh, widely used on Android because a uh, reverse engineer can uh, run the, the Frida server on the remote devices, uh, develop and inject uh, their script directly from their host machine. So it's uh, really convenient and uh, they can uh, debug at both uh, Java and native level. So it's uh, really powerful. Uh, in practice, uh, how does it work? Uh, first, we need to find the address of the function uh, we're interested in and declare callbacks, which will be uh, called before and after the, the function is called. Uh, so that way uh, you can print the arguments passed to the function and the written value. Uh, however, uh, we still face some uh, limitation here, uh, as you can see, because um, uh, we, we can print arguments, but we're not able to understand uh, how the function processes them. Uh, so uh, that's where QBDI can give us a hand uh, to uh, better, I mean, deeper understand this function. Okay, so uh, first off, a uh, quick introduction of QBDI. Uh, QBDI has been um, uh, initially developed by uh, Cédric Tessier and uh, Charles Lubin. Uh, when working at Quarks Lab. Uh, like Frida, uh, it's a DBI framework, but it, uh, it has been designed another way. Uh, indeed, um, it's based on uh, LLVM and it rather work at basic block and instruction scale. And uh, yeah, that's uh, why it can help us get an accurate understanding of the function uh, we're looking into. Um, okay, uh, that's cool, but how to use it? Uh, a DBI tool doesn't uh, instrument the old code because it would be like uh, a pain in terms of performances. Uh, as a result, uh, we need to explicitly specify some parts of the memory we're interested in. Uh, it can be a whole module or only a specific part of it. Uh, you can also instrument the entire other space, but I highly discourage you from doing so because it's uh, super heavy and there's a few use cases where you need to instrument all the process. So yeah, it's not a, a great idea. Uh, then in order to tell QBDI uh, what you want to gather, uh, you need to define what we call uh, callbacks. Uh, basically a callback is a function called whenever encountering a specific situation. 
for example, uh, before, after executing an instruction, uh, when you come across a new basic block you haven't seen before, or when the code jumps to a range that isn't handled by QBDI, it's like uh, really useful for, for getting a dependency like library call, for example. Okay, uh, so that was theory, uh, but now let's play around with the C++ API with a quick demo. Uh, so I'm gonna detail uh, all these steps uh, while uh, showing you uh, the code. So I hope uh, it worked. Okay, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so uh, the scenario is uh, we have a library called uh, Strong Crypto which contains uh, an interesting function uh, called uh, in-place encrypt. Uh, basically, we would like to generate an execution trace of this function. Uh, so first of all, we need to load the library into uh, the, proce the, the process memory. So it's just a call to DL open. Uh, then we need to find the address of the function uh, with DL sim. Uh, then we need to set up uh, the arguments that need to be paced uh, to the function. So there's uh, only four here. So here is uh, the key, uh, the length of the key, uh, the, length, uh, the message and the, left, the length of the message. And then we can execute the function through QBDI. So let's have a look at this function here. Okay. First of all, we need to create uh, the, the QBDI VM. Uh, then uh, we need to allocate uh, a virtual stack uh, here of size uh, 100 in hexadecimal. Uh, we can uh, we need to define uh, the the range uh, the instrumented range. Uh, so we, here is uh, like the whole module the the, fun the the function is contained in. Uh, we need to define a, a callback. So here this function will be called before executing uh, instruction. Uh, this function only uh, just uh, is responsible for printing the the current address and the disassembly uh, of the of the instruction. Uh, then we need to simulate the call. Uh, it means uh, to prepare uh, the registers and uh, the virtual stack with arguments and the written value. Uh, that way, uh, QBDI can know uh, when uh, the the execution is over. Uh, then we uh, would just uh, run the the functions through QBDI, uh, get the region value, uh, free the virtual stack, and uh, just return. Let's uh, run it. See. Okay, uh, so let's compile it and uh, just run it. Okay, so uh, it it seems great. Sorry, uh, we have the address and uh, the disassembly of the of the instruction. So that's great. Uh, let's get back to the slides. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, what if we could combine uh, like Friday and QBDI like together? Um, to do so, uh, we're gonna have a, uh, a look at the concrete example. Uh, I suppose that everyone here has already heard of WhatsApp, which is currently the most uh, downloaded uh, instant messaging application. Uh, so it could be a great fit, for, uh, a great target for us. Uh, we've noticed uh, it embeds a, a library called libwhatsapp, which contains uh, a large part of their code. Uh, since it's a GNI library, the first uh, function called right after the library loading is GNI unload. Uh, this function is worth inspecting because uh, developers uh, sometimes use it to to hide some uh, secret mechanism in it. Uh, in order to understand what this function is doing, uh, we would like to know which part of the code are actually executed. Uh, for example, uh, like we just did, we could generate uh, an execution trace containing uh, every instruction uh, that has been executed from the beginning um, to the end of the function. I mean, uh, I mean including uh, sub-functions. Uh, the idea is uh, instead of letting the, the function run as usual, we could execute it uh, through QBDI. Uh, in practice, uh, we can take advantage of the, the replace feature of Friday to change the real implementation of the function. Uh, so we're gonna uh, set up QBDI with the proper context, uh, execute uh, GNI unload with QBDI, and then uh, forward the written value uh, to prevent the application from crashing. 
like uh, resume uh, the application normally. Uh, so let's have a look at the implementation to better understand how to set it up. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, here is uh, the Friday scripts. Uh, first, uh, things uh, like uh, libwhatsapp will be loaded uh, dynamically. We need to wait uh, for it to be uh, loaded in memory. Uh, so yeah, we need to wait. Uh, to do so, first of all, we need to attach uh, the gelopen implementation of Android. So here, uh, check uh, the first parameter, which is the finance. And if it's uh, the right library, we just uh, replace, call the replace function here. And uh, we're gonna have a see at, at uh, this function. Uh, okay, so this function is responsible for replacing the implementation of uh, GNI unload. Uh, first, uh, it, um, it needs to like revert to the initial implementation uh, because Freida has uh, instrumented the function. And then we need to make sure that uh, changes have been committed properly uh, with the call to flush. Uh, then we need to uh, execute the function through QBDI and uh, call this same function again, uh, just uh, to, because uh, we, I mean, if GNI unload is called uh, at some point, uh, we just need to call this, uh, this new function and not the real one. Uh, in the uh, in the case of GNI unload, it's supposed to be called only one, so there's no issue. It is just for uh, genericity. Okay, so let's have a look at the the execution function, uh, the QBDI execution function. Uh, it's uh, almost the same that I showed you in C++, except that now we need to synchronize uh, CPU register uh, with QBDI once uh, to avoid some uh, side side effects. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's pretty much the same. We need to uh, create the, the QBDI VM, uh, allocate the virtual stack, uh, instrument the module, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, call, uh, here we call uh, the functions through QBDI in the context of QBDI, uh, get the region value, and uh, synchronize back uh, the context if needed. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much all. Let's try to run it. Oh. Not really. Okay. Here we go. Um, so first of all, uh, we need to we have to compile the code to be able to access uh, the Friday bindings. Okay, was along. And now uh, let's try to spawn the WhatsApp application with uh, the script. Okay, so uh, it seems to work. Uh, we have the address and we have the, the disassembly of uh, the instruction. So yeah, it seems to work. Uh, I don't know if you can see uh, like the, like the emulator, but okay. So it uh, works. I, I think you can uh, get back to the slide. Um, so here we go. Um, so. Uh, having uh, an execution trace like that is great, but not really convenient uh, to inspect, to be honest. Um, I mean, it's not uh, as visual as it uh, would be in a disassembler with a graph view, for example, uh, when you can clearly see uh, conditional branches, uh, loops, and so on. So uh, a good option could be to integrate this information with a disassembler like IDA or Gaijo. Uh, now uh, we aim to generate a code coverage file that can be imported into both IDA and Gaidra. Fortunately, uh, this can be done natively, uh, but instead we need to use external plugins uh, like Lighthouse and Dragon Dance. Um, these two work with uh, GLCOV files uh, to colorize the executed blocks, I mean, executed basic blocks. Uh, so uh, the idea is to reuse the previous script uh, to gather information we need like memory layout and uh, the basic blocks uh, that have been hit uh, throughout the execution. And finally generate a code coverage file uh, that can be loaded into disassembly. So let's uh, see what it takes uh, to make it work. Um, okay, here. Okay, so um, as you can see, the script is uh, 
pretty much the same uh, that's the one I just show you. Uh, however, now we need to run the script from a Python code uh, we control. Uh, basically, the, the Python side will uh, receive information for the, from the JavaScript side and will be responsible for creating uh, the output uh, code coverage file in the proper format. Uh, so as it's not really interesting, uh, we're only going to focus on how to retrieve runtime information we need, like modules and uh, basic block with uh, QBDI. Okay, so uh, we still need to wait uh, for the function to be loaded. Uh, if it's the right uh, function, we just call this uh, part of the code. Uh, but before replacing the implementation, now uh, we need to send uh, the memory layout inform information uh, to the Python side. So with this function, it's just yeah, the, the module that has uh, been loaded into memory. Uh, then we call uh, the replace function, uh, which is uh, exactly the same. And uh, we just exec, uh, execute the function through QBDI. Uh, so yeah, now we don't need uh, to generate an execution trace. So we need uh, to place a callback at every instruction. Uh, instead, we, we need to declare uh, a callback that will be um, called uh, whenever uh, a new basic block is uh, discovered. So it's uh, just uh, this VM event here. And this function is called. Uh, basically, this function uh, is just responsible for uh, getting the module, uh, the, the module, yeah, of the the, the basic block is containing uh, the offset from the base address of the module and the size of the basic block. It just uh, send uh, this information to the Python side, like that. Okay, so now uh, let's try to execute it. If can switch. Okay, so we still need to compile uh, the script. Okay, and just uh, try to, I don't know if you can see, and just uh, run the, the Python script uh, to tell uh, that we want to run uh, WhatsApp and just generate a code coverage file. Okay, so uh, working, okay. So uh, the file uh, has been uh, written. Uh, so let's check. Okay, so now we have uh, this file here. Uh, let's try to import it uh, into uh, Kaedra. Uh, so here is a uh, Dragon Dance. So we can just uh, define a Jericho file. Okay, it has been imported and uh, we can just try to colorize what has been executed. Okay, so uh, that's uh, really cool uh, because, because at a glance, uh, we can exactly know what has been executed. Uh, yeah, so for example, let me search for a, a function, or for example, here. Okay, yeah. Uh, so for example, here, uh, we can see that uh, this block, this block, and this block uh, have been executed, and uh, this block, this block, and this block have not. So it's really uh, visual. And uh, thanks to Dragon Dance, uh, we can also, uh, we can also uh, know what's, uh, if you have uh, multiple traces, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, you can know uh, what's similar and what's different between several execution traces. Uh, so it turns out to be uh, really convenient when it comes to comparing uh, some traces. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's get back to the slides. Um, uh, obviously this technique uh, works with uh, every native function, as long as you know how many per, uh, arguments uh, it takes. Uh, and you can define whatever QBDI callbacks you want, uh, depending on your on your needs. Uh, so here, uh, it was about discovering uh, new basic blocks, but you may want to, I don't know, uh, record uh, execution transfer or memory accesses. Um, yeah, so just to wrap it up, uh, there will be a, like, a, a follow-up article which will be probably published uh, in the next few weeks uh, on the Quark Lab uh, blog. So if you're interested uh, in uh, trying this out uh, on your own, uh, just stay tuned. Uh, it will uh, like 
which will be like a review of uh, what we've seen today. And uh, that's uh, pretty much all for me. Uh, thanks for listening and attending this uh, webinar. And if you have uh, any question, like feel free to ask in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Yeah. Well, um, do not be shy. We have got time and uh, time for question. So, uh, so Chanel is yours. Dear attendees. Maybe a question with uh, uh, the panelist. No question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> You have been too clear, uh, Tom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Philip, nothing to, to nothing to add on your side. Maybe you don't <laughs> hear me. Digging off. <laughs> You're just digging. <laughs> so, uh, you will be able to join Tom. Uh, uh, if you uh, if you want if you had um, uh, uh, there is in the a future ah some yeah. may one question yeah so I would, um, so have you used similar uh, method to debug uh, embedded system other than Android um, to be honest no <laughs> but uh, it's possible uh, the only limit is uh, that uh, for now QBDI only supports uh, x86 and x84, uh, x86 and x64, sorry. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can use it uh, if, uh, if you're running an embedded system uh, using this architecture, but I'm not sure you can find a lot, to be honest. But the ARM support is, uh, is supposed to be um, released, uh, I mean, hopefully soon. <laughs> Perfect. Another one. No. So I think uh, we can stop there. And uh, finally, thank you very much for this talk, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And so we will end uh, this afternoon. So uh, we will be we will be back uh, tomorrow um, afternoon at uh, two p.m. with red teaming uh, in the first time, then detect and defend, and uh, in the second half of the afternoon. And we will uh, end the afternoon with a concert with uh, Clément, our captain. So. Have a, a good evening. We are going to release the slides um, in uh, in the evening, and uh, we will be back for the uh, for the the video, but later on uh, in in the week in the following weeks. We are going to release uh, all the slides uh, very very quickly, and uh, follow Twitter account for. Uh, the, the availability of the of the video. So thank you very much for this first afternoon, and see you tomorrow. Bye.